When we think of the food traditions of Maryland, we often associate the state with blue crabs and the famous Old Bay seasoning. But as we head farther in and enter Mountain Maryland, different traditions are hiding out in plain sight. On the main streets of Frostburg, and hidden behind the trees in Mount Savage respectively, B&B Meats and Evergreen Heritage Center work to keep these traditions of food and bringing people together alive and well. A business passed down from generation to generation, B&B Meats prides itself on Frostburg bologna, belly buster sandwiches, and the family behind the business. I started helping out whenever I was very young, and uh, it just kind of became more involved and more, it became more involved over time. And uh, as I got older and, and um, out of school, uh, it became a, a full-time thing and, and, and now a career and, and in some ways a calling and uh, just an enjoyable part of my life. We are probably most widely known for as far as nationwide and globally um, for what a lot of people refer to as Frostburg bologna or Ingalls bologna or mountain bologna. Um, some call it summer sausage. thing that was really cool was I a friend of mine had approached me right after I graduated high school we were about college age to uh, go on a trip with him and his church to Nicaragua and uh, I didn't have anything going for me at the time uh, that was too pressing so I went it was a two week long trip and while in Nicaragua I was wearing a a B&B hat and uh I ran into somebody who said, hey, the, the first person I ran into and one of the only people I ran into that spoke English. And I thought she was scamming me. And she goes, B&B Meats, is that the place with uh, those giant sandwiches in, in Frostburg, Maryland, in America? And I was like, who put you up to this? I thought she was like with the church or something. And she, here she was a foreign exchange student who went to FSU for a few semesters. And I just happened to bump it. So that was a really cool story. Um hey, look, is there any way that the tradition of the big sandwich just started or did it just come about? Um, well, uh, my dad and his brothers that kind of started the business, they're pretty big guys. I don't know if that's just it evolved from there and we get uh our bread specially made from lorenzo's bakery in frostburg um just so bread is specifically big enough to hold all the hold everything so um i think it just is the way we did it and we wanted it's kind of the way we do everything i guess you would say like um how can we do the best quality and and give people the most for their money because all our friends here work really hard for their money and um and they just we just feel like they deserve it and it's the kind of service we would want so I, I don't know if there's a specific uh reason for it it just just the way it's always been maybe I, I'd have to ask Dad if there was a, a specific reason, but I know all those guys uh, got their start working on the farm, uh, my grandfather's farm, and then they later uh, went on to work in the coal mines and stuff. So uh, I would assume a large sandwich would come in handy uh, doing that kind of work, and, and it still does for people who stop in to get Traditions are what makes a community. Every community has some sort of tradition they hold near and dear. 
Not every tradition is served on a plate, some go beyond that. Evergreen provides Mountain Maryland with locally grown food and a learning experience for all to show how traditions are preserved in this day and age. So I am a volunteer, an unpaid volunteer. I am the, uh, uh, the president of the Evergreen Heritage Center. I uh, work with our partners. So certainly um, what would traditionally be known as business development is, is one of the hats that I wear. My background before I started working uh, with Evergreen in 2008, um, my uh, career was primarily um, project management, um, business development, and strategic planning. And I joke about the fact that uh, uh, my career was, uh, was good training for what I do now. <laughs> so, uh, so I do that um, and um, oversee all of our various programs we have. I do a lot of grant writing. I will tell you, I do a lot of grant writing. In, in combination with that, I do a lot of grant reporting. That's more, even more important than writing the request for money. You have to tell them what you did and you successfully did what you said you were going to do. I think more than specific foods, it's really trying to show people um, what you can do with, with just basic things that either you grow yourself or you, or you buy. We teach, uh, folks about, uh, of course, uh, pickling. Uh, uh, we teach them about, um, uh, uh, canning. We teach them about drying. Um, we teach them about, uh, you know, how you can grow your own tea. Um, and then just use sunlight. I personally believe that it's it would be very beneficial for all of us to know where our food comes from, how to grow our own food if need be. I think it's wonderful to grow it whether we need to or not. May Day is an ancient tradition of celebrating spring. It was originally a pagan festival celebrated on May 1st, but through the years it has evolved and moved around the world. It is traditionally celebrated in Europe, but there used to be festivities in our own county. In general, May Day sort of celebrations, um, when, and when I was a little girl, they consisted of like, gathering flowers and going and doing the ring the doorbell and ditch and leaving flowers on the doorstep. Um, and we did a lot of that when I was growing up. And that was kind of the May Day tradition that I think was shared throughout the United States. Um, I know that in some locations, they often put a maypole up and they do dances around the maypole with the ribbons and that sort of thing. Um, and I found that that's fairly common in this area in places, especially kind of on the Pennsylvania side, I haven't de delved very deeply into it. And I didn't even realize that there was a May Day celebration until I saw that you all were looking into it in this class and people were saying what they had done around, I guess, the Mount Savage area for May Day. So I do think though um, that the May Day traditions in general are kind of on the wane. Um, we're not seeing those as popularized as they once were. I'm not sure. I know that I have a son who's 10 years old and I don't think that he, has ever done the pick flowers, ring a doorbell, and run, and leave flowers on the doorstep in the basket. So, um, you know, maybe I've failed as a folklorist and I haven't taught him that tradition. But, but you know, that's how traditions work. They, they ebb and flow, and they wax and wane. And I think that that May Day tradition is one of those, unless somehow it's institutionalized. If it's institutionalized by the school system, or if it's institutionalized by a particular community, then they tend to be longer lasting. Like May Day, many traditions rise and fall and die out. However, there is one type of folktale that has gone strong for many, many generations. Ghost stories. Every civilization at any time has had some kind of ghost story, and Frostburg is no stranger to tales of specters. My name is Jenna Delaney, and I am the hotel manager. 
The Hotel Gunter in Frostburg has a rich history beginning in 1897 when it opened as the Hotel Gladstone. There was a doll in the attic and every day it looked like it kind of moved a little bit. And so I asked everybody who has access to the attic and I'm like, are you guys like playing with me or something? And they don't move it. So I don't know if somebody has the code to the attic and they move it just to get everybody spooked. But everybody that does, I've asked and like, I know they're not lying. So I'm just like, and I've like personally gone up there and I've touched it and moved it. And then I came back the next day and it was back in the spot that I moved it from. And I'm like, okay, so I don't touch that. It consisted of 100 rooms, a barber shop and a cafe, along with tennis courts and a petting farm. In addition to housing travelers, the building also contained a jail, a speakeasy, and at one point, a cockfighting ring in the basement. The prisoners that were transported down Route 40 would spend the night in the hostile subterranean jail, while the federal marshals stayed in the upstairs accommodations. A door slamming behind me, which really caught me off guard because it really doesn't close that well and it's a really stiff door that is on carpet so that freaked me out and it was on a floor that I rarely go to it's just the floor for tenants so not even the hotel guests and it caught me really off guard um at times I swear somebody says my name and it's like really creepy because it's like Jenna and I'm like like, I'll look around because every once in a while, it is one of my coworkers asking me to do something. But then I'll ask them, like, did you say my name? And then they're like, no, I didn't hear anything. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> the Hotel Gladstone fell into disrepair in the middle of the 20th century and was repurposed by William Gunter with a grand total of $35,000 and renovations were put in the works. He renamed it Hotel Gunter and spent the next 20 years making additions, including electrical lighting, a 175-seat dining room, and a mahogany bar. During that time, Hotel Gunter was considered one of the finest hotels and restaurants between Baltimore and Pittsburgh. The new owners have kept the jail intact, and have also installed a replica of a coal mine to honor the area's mining history. This landmark hotel still contains individually decorated rooms and a banquet hall for events to this day. When we were renovating the speakeasy downstairs, I've heard from two different people. They've heard like a tune of music that's been playing down there. And it's not been like a complete song or something. They just hear like almost a chime of music. And then when they like look around, it's like gone which I think is super cool though, because that's our speakeasy. Like when you think about entertainment back then, that's mm -hmm. where the entertainment happened. So that's awesome. I had a housekeeper swear up and down to me once that there was somebody in the coal mine <laughs> shoot. Cause we like, we have access behind different um, places like closets, like behind the coal mine is where we have our law our, our liquor inventory. So, I've been down there a thousand times and I've never had any kind of interaction, but she swore. She's like, I swear I just saw somebody move. It was a man like described him. Well, then I was making um, a book of old pictures I found from previous owners or people that donated from the town. And in one of the pictures, like you're just looking at this picture of men sitting in a, in the coal mine and then all of a sudden there's like one face that just looks like a ghost. And it was like exactly like what she described. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> all these stories are like, it's spooky, but I've never had any kind of bad like thing happen. I don't know. This, the scariest is definitely the door, but I don't feel like anything is ill will or something like that. I had a woman come in off the street, book a room, and the whole time she's booking it, like this was during the week, so we didn't have, I don't think we had any other check-ins. Um, 
and she was like is it haunted and I'm like no like I mean (laughs) if you want it to be haunted it is if it's not then it's not I don't know it's what you believe because a lot of people I feel like that might steer them away well she was just like so I'm safe and I'm like yeah nothing's ever happened you're fine you get your own set of keys like you can lock the door and whatnot it's just like any other hotel she came downstairs after checking in and was like my room's haunted can I have a different one so I moved her rooms and then she did it again and I was like I went up there with her and checked everything that she was saying and then she's like okay it's fine and then not even like 10 minutes later, I went upstairs to check on her again and she was gone. Like she left the hotel. She, she left her keys and everything and then she left. She paid for the room and then she just left. She never came back. Not only do places such as the historically rich Hotel Gunter contain gripping local ghost stories, but another large piece of Frostburg folklore holds the many tales of coal mining ghosts. One that I wrote about that was a, uh, well, secondhand information. The lady had, um, had called me and told me about her grandfather seeing the, the Scottish lights as she called them. And he was in a mine in, either around Mount Savage or Shaft. I'm not quite sure where it was. But anyway, he and several other men were at the end of their shift, and they were the only ones in the mine. And they did have a mule and a wagon that they were loading the coal onto. And um, he saw three lights coming from the entrance of the mine, kind of bobbing toward him. And he thought it was three men coming in, but he he didn't he couldn't figure out why at the end of the day would mine, men be coming into the mine. And so they, you know, he kind of ignored it for a while. And then he looked up and realized that there was nothing underneath of the lights. They were just lights bobbing. There were no no miners lanterns or anything, just lights. And he knew what they were. And he told the other miners to drop their their picks and run. And they did. And just as they got out of the way, the roof collapsed. It killed the mule, but it didn't kill any of them. And he knew it was a warning. You know, the Scottish lights told him to to get out of the mine. And then another time he was walking from Midlothian to Shaft to go to work. And he saw lights on the road bobbing. And he just turned around and went home. And that afternoon, the mine foreman came to his house and said that there, there had been a roof collapse in that mine. And, um, and of course, he, he heated the Scottish lights and didn't go into the mine. The story about my great, my third great grandmother, she was born in Wales. And the whole family worked in the mines in the whales. The, the boys, the girls, if you were big enough to walk, you went to work in the mines. And when she was very young, she was little, she was petite. So um, she was uh, kind of the driver. So she would hitch the mule up. And then when the wagon or the was full of coal, then she, she would drive, she would sit on the mule and drive it out of the mine. Well, after a while, the, our family legend says that after a while, she became more efficient at hitching a team of horses or mules than any of the men. And so when she immigrated here to the United States in 1869, she thought she was going to go to work in the coal mines. And she went and she said, I can hitch a team of horses faster than anybody and blah, blah. And they just pushed her away. They, you know, there will be no women in the mine because they are bad luck. And she was very highly insulted (laughs) that she was not able to work in the coal mines here. But they tell me that because she couldn't actually go into the mine that she would go to the tipple, they lived in Zillman. She would go to the tipple and fill a basket of coal and 
put it on her head and carry it home on her head. And that's how they heated their house during the winter. So that's, that's really the only ones that I know, you know, that affect me or that somebody has told me about. From the shores of the Chesapeake Bay to the sloped peaks of the Appalachian Mountains, Maryland continues to grasp a hold on varieties, whether it be enjoying age-old recipes and the comfort of locals, or investigating the old stories of history, ghosts, and celebrations of new beginnings. Traditions lost to time and practices that are all but extinct are still kept alive by the people who care for them. As residents, it is our responsibility to remember what makes us unique, from our famous foods to our chilling tales, we should all embrace what makes Appalachia what it is. Through our tight-knit community, we can keep these traditions alive by preserving our past.